I consider myself to be a youth empowerment activist. It is a term that I created to define the work that I do. One of the things that you'll find out being students, and if you are a student activist, is you, you start out thinking of yourself as this young activist, and you do youth activism work. But over time, you start to get older, right? And so for me, uh, I became so fascinated and intrigued with the youth activism work that at some point, I considered myself to be an expert in this area. And so as I got older and I wasn't a youth anymore, I had to define what it was that I do. And so I, I call myself a youth empowerment activist. Um, I began on this journey uh, as a college student at the University of Rochester. And during uh, those days, the, the mid 80s, um, I had the honor and the, the, the privilege of being a student in a course taught by Eugene Genovese, a great historian. Um, Dr. Genovese uh, taught a seminar that I was in, and um, in those days he was a Marxist. <laughs> by the end of his career, uh, he had shifted out of that uh, orientation and was considered to be a, a pretty staunch conservative. Um, I say that as a precursor to some of the other things that I'm going to say about conservatives as we get <laughs> deeper into this conversation. One of the things that he introduced me to was a book that became one of the most important books that has impacted my work. It is a book called There is a River, written by a historian named Vincent Harding. And in this book, Vincent Harding traces the history of uh, black folks in America from the shores of Africa, through the Middle Passage, through the slavery experience and Reconstruction, through the Harlem Renaissance years, the Garvey years, through the uh, civil rights and the black power movements, and then it ends in the early 70s. But one of the interesting things about this book that captured my imagination, um, as a young student activist, I was really interested in, and many of us were, what would, what would be the defining uh, moment of our own generation as activists? And growing up um, after the civil rights and the black power movements, these movements are so large and looming most folks couldn't imagine what an activism would look like that didn't exactly emulate that. And so what this book does and what it talks about is it talks about the, it uses the uh, river as a metaphor. And the river he uses as a metaphor for black political struggle. And he says every generation produces another generation of activists, organizations, leaders, and movements and that river keeps moving, and that struggle for liberation and justice and freedom continues to move forward. Um, and so I want to use that to kind of set the tone for what I want to talk about, which is uh, the Ferguson effect. When Ferguson uh, exploded in the summer of 2014, ironically, I was out of the country. I was in Florence, and I was watching this happen um, over the internet. And I just remember thinking, um, this is amazing. I mean, I'm seeing, um, you know, people are posting vines, and some folks had live streams. They're streaming what's happening on the street. Um, and I just remember thinking that this is, this is it's amazing on a number of different levels. But one thing that was clear in my mind was that this was something that, that was going to be different this time. It was something that was different about this moment. And so I, 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 um, one of my younger colleagues showed me how I could go back and search and find one of my own tweets. This was fascinating to me. <laughs> and so I went back and I found this tweet that I, that I sent on uh, the date that Mike, uh, Mike Brown was killed in Ferguson. And basically it says, this is the generation that will end this nightmare. Um, so. A week after, um, I'm sorry, a month after the Ferguson explosion, a young writer named Tef Poe, who's also an MC, um, and also one of the founders of an organization called Hands Up United, he penned an amazing piece for Time Magazine that was entitled, Obama has forsaken us, but we must not stop fighting injustice. Around the same time, again, about a month after Ferguson, another young activist named Janetta Elsey, she penned a piece for the um, ebony.com. Uh, the piece was entitled, 
when I close my eyes at night, I see people running from tear gas in their own neighborhood. These two uh, statements, um, I think, are, are, are defining moments for this Ferguson effect, OK? So fl uh, a flash forward about uh, two months later, the police chief of St. Louis, being interviewed by the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, makes the uh, statement where he first uses the expression, the Ferguson effect. And he basically says that the um, police and his department are not as enthusiastic about doing their job because they're afraid that they're going to get caught on videotape and end up being the next uh, videotape star <laughs> uh, of, the, of the country. Um, he also added, and this, you know, as people tell a story, the story gets told over and over. By the time you get down the line, it's a little bit different than it started. He also added that the, um, the fact that the police were so preoccupied with, the pro with, with trying to, I guess, fight the protesters, um, they didn't have as much time to do police work. And as a result of these two things, um, there would be, uh, or there was, they were seeing a, a crime uh, increase. Now, this idea of the Ferguson effect was something that began to be um, reiterated by other folks um, over the course of the next year. Um, so the next big one is uh, Mayor Rahm Emanuel. Uh, he makes a statement in Chicago at some point. He's being interviewed, and he uses the term the Ferguson effect. Um, ironically, that he would suggest that crime was going to go up as a result of non-policing, and later on, we found out that he was a part of a conspiracy to keep a videotape from being shown um, where the police were killing someone uh, in his city. And later on, um, this officer was arrested for this. Um, after that, there was a uh, conference in Chicago of policemen, an international association uh, of police conference. And at this conference, the head of the FBI uses the terminology, uh, he doesn't use the terminology of the Ferguson effects, but he reiterates this idea that the rise of young people protesting against police violence was causing a rise of violence and a fear amongst police that went unspoken and hu in hushed tones publicly, but he was going to articulate it um, on this day. Following him, the uh, head of the DEA um, a little while later, uh, Chuck Rosenberg, he makes, again, the statement. He does use the terminology of the Ferguson effect and says that this is something that is increasing crime amongst, uh, throughout the country. And there's all this kind of alarmist talk. And interestingly enough, the, me the mainstream media in initially doesn't respond but begins to push back. Equally important was the writing of a uh, conservative journalist uh, by the name of Heather McDonald, who, who wrote about the Ferguson effect in really a non-apologetic uh, kind of way, saying that crime was increasing, murders were increasing, and we, this was a terrible thing that was happening. Um, interestingly, she was also, she's also written about things like black uh, crime uh, being higher, and that is the, that black people commit more crimes, and that is the reason why there's more policing, and that is the reason why there's more incarceration. Um, not that there's more policing in black communities. Um, but this idea of the Ferguson effect really was something that she helped to popularize. So let me just let you think about that for a second. So we have this idea of the Ferguson effect. Why is this problematic? I think that one of the interesting things about this is that it's actually a, a, a real interesting lesson in how racial uh, narratives are shaped. During this uh, current election season, people have talked about the idea of the super predator. It's come up in, uh, relative to um, Secretary Clinton uh, something that she, a term that she used 
back in the day, um, and had, people have brought it up again as a critique of her now. Um, but this idea, similar idea, you take this idea, this kind of a cold word, and you throw it out there, and what happens is people gravitate around these ideas and the images that are associated with it, and as a result, public policy is shaped. Interestingly, in this time, people reacted in the media, kind of pushing back. Um, and so I'm hoping that that's not what's going to happen this time. But the term is still very prevalent out there. Um, people use the terminology of the uh, dog whistle politics, which essentially says, you know, people are using racial code to connect with a certain audience as they're trying to, they want to communicate a certain message, but they want to talk nice <laughs> in public. So they're communicating something to one audience that's picking up on the racial code. I think that what's, what goes on is a little bit more sophisticated than that. I think that what goes on is um, there is a, a, a uh, graphic arts professor at the University of Buffalo named John Jennings. And he talks about the history of uh, racial um, stereotypes in America. And he says that racial stereotypes are powerful because they're reused over and over and over again. The racial stereotypes don't, don't change. It's the same racial stereotype, it's just refashioned and it's used again and again and again and again. A book that illustrates this with a great degree of accuracy is a book written by Jabari Yassim called The N-Word. Jabari Yassim used to be the um, editor of the Washington Post um, uh, book, book section. Um, and so this ability and this power of stereotypes is a very important part of what's going on with terminology like the Ferguson effect. But it's bigger than just a dog whistle. Because what we've had happen in the country in the last 20 years or so are, are two things. One, a media that is quick to equate opinion alongside the facts. And so with this conversation about the Ferguson effect, we often see the media presenting it almost as if it's two sides. And we see this throughout media where media feels like they got to give you a conservative opinion and they've got to give you the liberal opinion. And it doesn't really matter if one of them are just lying <laughs> or they're not really dealing in the facts. The point is that they're presenting both sides. This is a dangerous thing that I think we've come to do. So this is, I think, one of the components added to the stereotype that I think makes it a much more powerful thing than just a dog whistle. The second thing that I think has happened in the last 20 years is that we've, we've, we've come to equate uh, these, uh, what I call conservative talking points about race. They've, they've become embedded in mainstream culture and media to the point of common sense. So that because of this media dynamic, we hear these, we hear these things, they're not accurate, it doesn't matter, it's an opinion, and the opinion is elevated to the same level as a fact. So what I want to argue is that we, we have to do more than just push back. The media pushed back. There were articles written in the Atlantic Monthly. There were studies that have been done already that pushed back against this notion of the Ferguson effect. There, uh, most recently, one just was done last week in Baltimore, uh, John Hopkins University sociologist who did a study that looked at the Ferguson effect and, it, and whether or not it was true for the city of Baltimore. And they looked at Baltimore over about a year period where they're looking at uh, was there an increase in crime or not. Other studies and other uh, think tanks have looked at this case also. Many of them have concluded that there is not, it, there isn't a Ferguson effect. There isn't an, an increase in crime um, that correlates uh, serious enough to warrant that this is an actual thing. However, in my opinion, because of the way in which these, this kind of terminology works, it's still very effective and can very much still have a very real impact on po public policy. So what I want to suggest is that we work with another definition of what the Ferguson effect is. And perhaps by giving folks a different definition than this erroneous one, perhaps we can stop ourselves as a nation from going down this terrible road again of rehashing these same uh, uh, stereotypes and allowing them to work themselves into public policy, particularly at a time when the president and, uh, has been pushing back against the criminal justice system um, with a very effective uh, program at the national level, which I hope we'll see 
also impact um, at the state level. But there are a lot of people who don't want to see this. They like the idea that we should lock up uh, black and brown people uh, disproportionate in their numbers to the population for nonviolent drug crimes. So here's the definition that I think we should work with. I would like for people to think about the Ferguson effect as a decision by young people in their community who felt that they were under attack by a system that wasn't working for them, by an America that was no longer working for them, by a police force that came in in a militarized fashion and treated them as non-citizens in their own neighborhood. And because of their decision to stand up and to fight for justice and to fight for democracy that we have been told uh, is a part of our citizenship rights, um, they have inspired a generation of young people around the country um, to do the same. So this is the definition that I would like to see us work with in terms of the Ferguson effect. I'm going to end with a f a four points. One, um, international studies professor at Trinity College, Vijay Prashad, he says in a lecture that he gave at uh, Williams College a few weeks ago on Palestine that we have entered the age of the ordinary person. And the ordinary person uh, is advocating a politics of something. We have to do something. That the conditions are so horrible that people are living under, that ordinary people are standing up around the world saying we have to do something. And he uses this in a uh, lecture about Palestine. Tefpo, who I mentioned at the beginning of this uh, uh, presentation, he said, writing a year after the uh, Mike Brown Rebellion, which is what he called it, that the, the dehumanization of black people has spiraled out of control in this country. For too long, there is no longer a, for too long there has not been a pathway for, to justice for young black people trapped in these uh, communities. Um, the Ferguson effect is this generation's answer. Thank you very much.